What is good YouTube? My name is Ash Porter and welcome to my channel. Today we are looking at this quality book which I have read, The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. Now this book looks exactly at what the title says. It looks at that problem we face as omnivores when it comes to choosing our food. Before we jump into this video, um, for those of you who may be a little bit like me and needed a tad of clarification when it came to exactly what omnivore meant, just so you know, the definition of omnivore is an animal or person that eats a variety of food of both plant and animal origin. So there you have it, already we're a little bit more educated. So as usual, this video will be broken into three different parts. The first part, I'll be saying, is the book any good? Do I recommend it? Who do I recommend it to? The second part, what is the key information in this book? Now, bear in mind, with a book like this, it is chunky. There is so much good information in there, so I'm not gonna be able to cover it all, but I will be highlighting the key information that stood particularly out to me. And then the third section is gonna be about how can I apply what I've learned to my life? You know, does this book actually impact the way I live? And I'm gonna say, yes, it does. And we'll find out all about that later. So section number one, is this book any good? And do I recommend it? And the answer is quite simply, yes, I really do recommend this book. I promise you, this is no exaggeration. For the two weeks I was reading this book, I, every morning I was excited to read it and I enjoyed literally every moment of consuming this book. What I particularly love about the way Pollen writes and this book in particular is that it is full of information. It is full of knowledge. It is full of like really high IQ stuff, you know, things you want to be learning about and make you feel clever reading about. But not only that, it has those things, yet yeah, it's really accessible. It's not a high read, it's not like it's stupidly academic. Actually, I think this is a book which can be read by pretty much anyone and they can gain that information. And that's why I think this book is so good. What's also so impressive about the, this book is the way it's crafted around his stories of his adventures to write this book. Whether that's his trip to Polyface Farm or whether that hits him hunting wild pigs in the forest, I felt immersed in the story. I felt like I was there, that not only was it a book which was feeding my mind and giving me new knowledge and learning, I felt immersed in the stories like I was there with him on his adventures. And also, you know, despite the fact this book came out in 2006, which in the grand scheme of things is actually quite a while ago, <laughs> um, it's still so relevant. You know, industry moves so fast nowadays, technology advances. We I mean, imagine the food industry since 2006 has probably changed a lot, yet we still face many of the problems he's talking about, about the food industry sucking and really needing changing if it's gonna be sustainable and we're gonna look after our planet. Finally, what I love about this book is that it's challenging and it's thought provoking. You may read it and it may really challenge your lifestyle. It may rock your boat. It may annoy you and frustrate you at times because it is challenging the way we consume and the way we live in the 21st century. Yet, I think books like this are so important and that's what reading is all about. Learning isn't just about learning the stuff that is exactly what you think or suits your lifestyle. You have to push yourself out there sometimes. And I think this book is exactly one of those books. And so, who should read this book? If you're a foodie, read this book. If you care about the environment, read this book. If you care about animal welfare, read this book. If you just wanna learn a bit more about how our food comes from nature and makes it to our plate, read this book. The reality is we all eat, we all consume food, we are all part of this industry. And so I think this is basic knowledge which we should all know. Okay, so now for section two. What is the key information that stood out to me? And the first thing, which I'm gonna say the headline and then I'm gonna go into a little bit more, but basically our food industry, the modern industry of food, it sucks. So just to clarify, while editing this and watching it back, I don't think I'm clear enough here. And when I say in this video, um, the food industry, I particularly am trying to point out like pollen does, the production side of that. So that's like the raising of animals, um, the way we grow crops, um, all that kind of stuff. That in particularly sucks. 
So the first example of this is monocultures just do not work. We are convinced, or for some reason, the food industry just is sticking to growing a single crop in one place or raising a single animal on one farm. And it just doesn't work. You look at nature and monoculture doesn't exist. It's diverse. It's an ecosystem that where um, animals and plants, they rely on each other to thrive in vast quantities in different species. And on our modern farms, we don't find that and it is hurting our environment and it is hurting our land. Another reason that the food industry kind of sucks is that we waste so many calories. And so Pollen says there is a limit to how many of those calories the world's arable land can produce each year. An industrial meal of meat and processed food consumes and wastes an unconsciousable amount of that energy. To eat corn directly, as Mexicans and many Africans do, is to consume all of that energy from that corn. But when you feed that corn to a steer or a chicken, 90% of that energy is lost. And so what that means is, in a plant, there's a certain amount of calories. In grass, in crops, whatever you're feeding these animals, there's a certain amount of calories. And across the food process, if we are feeding to that, by the time that meat hits our plate, 90% of those calories are lost. We think of how many people in the world are starving or how much land is used to feed and raise animals or grow crops. It just isn't needed. Our world could be fed and we don't need to use all this land if we just didn't waste all these calories in that process. Another reason, these modern fertilizers which we have developed, they are they are polluting the world. Like yes, they may make uh, crops grow better in a monoculture. They may help harvests increase, but there is so many um, records and uh, examples of them polluting our world. Even in this book, he talks about a farm that grows corn and the nitrogen that runs off from the fertilizers off into the streams and then the rivers, and then it ends up in this giant pool the Gulf, in the Gulf of Mexico, like the size of a state, he was saying, just polluting our planet. That isn't okay. And the fourth and final example of why our food industry sucks is that animals are treated horrifically. Now in this book, he doesn't go into a lot of detail about this and he's not explicit, but that's mainly because he talks about how he wants to go visit um, these slaughterhouses or these big farms where animals are mass produced, but he's not allowed in. These big corporations, they don't want him seeing what is really happening. But I don't know about you, but I've read other books, I've seen other documentaries, and I know that we have a horrific meat industry that treats animals awfully. But it's not only that animals are treated awfully, that the scientists really think that a lot of the reasons these new superbugs keep being created is because of these horrific conditions animals are raised in, where literally thousands and thousands of them are shoved into small pens, small buildings where they never see the light of day. But also they just die on top of each other, they cannibalize each other, and it's just a breeding ground for germs and viruses and superbugs. The food industry creates that and that's the final reason it sucks. The second bit of key info is that well-managed pastures where it's diverse and it's an ecosystem, that is the way forward for sustainable farming and living. I'm just going to read some quotes to emphasise this point. If 16 million acres now being used to grow corn to feed cows in the United States became well-managed pasture, that would remove 14 billion pounds of carbon from the atmosphere each year, the equivalent of taking 4 million cows off the road. That's a lot of carbon. But researchers at the Land Institute have studied this question and calculated that in fact, more nutrients are produced, protein and carbohydrates, in an acre of well-managed pasture than in an acre of field corn. I don't have to say much more else about this. 
uh, Well Managed Pasture, he talks about our loads. There's a big example of a farm like this in the book. That is the way forward if we wanna be sustainable, if we wanna be ethical, and if we wanna look after our planet. The third thing that I learned, which was kind of a bit of a, one of those revelation moments, for you know, when it's something that's so obvious, but you haven't really thought about it before. And what really struck me about this book is, one, um, how out of touch with nature we are. We truly are out of touch with nature and the ecosystem we are part of. But not only that, but how reliant we are on the sun. It just hadn't occurred to me how the sun really is the source of life. Without the sun, um, we wouldn't eat. It's such a key part. And yeah, that's such a little thing, but it kind of blew my mind a little bit. And then finally, the bit I just want to read, he has this amazing little quote where he says, we eat by the grace of nature. I just thought that was a really beautiful way of putting, um, putting it, and to be honest, it's quite humbling. So now we're on to part three, applying what I've learned um, to, to my life and how I might change the way I live or how this might change. And But I wanna give a bit of context for my thoughts coming before this book, before I read it and how it might have changed or opened up my mind a little bit. So coming into this book, I came from a, a vegetarian standpoint. Nearly two years ago, I made the decision to go vegetarian. I did a lot of research and reading to really make an informed decision about, is that what's, what's best for my um, lifestyle, for the way I eat, for what's on my plate, for my omnivore's dilemma? And I came to the conclusion, yes, for a number of reasons, but that's my standpoint, and that's how I came into this book. And so, if I'm being honest, when I was reading this book, although he's definitely not advocating vegetarianism because he is a meat eater and he's totally okay with that and he wrestles with that in this book, um, I did come into it with that standpoint. And so, there's a lot of times I was reading it and I was thinking, oh, that's just an argument for vegetarianism. He just doesn't really realize it. And so that's the context in which I came into reading this book. And now what have I learned from that? And how have I changed? Well, I think the first thing is reading this book, he really wrestles um, with me eating. He doesn't do it explicitly, but it's in it, all his conversations, in his hunting, in his the way he watches the animals be, or the chickens specifically, be slaughtered at Polyface Farm. It's a constant battle of, is this okay? And I think having read this book and read his views and opinions and his experiences, I think for the first time since being vegetarian, I'd say, I'm not gonna rule out eating meat again. I think in the future, if there's a way that I can eat meat and I can feel like, you know, I've this has been sourced really ethically. This has not been damaging the environment and I'm not supporting the worldwide industrial meat industry. And, um, and it's still gonna be good for me. I think I could eat meat again, but I still know that right now I feel like vegetarianism is the lifestyle for me. I also especially liked his discussion that's near the end of the book about how we anthropomorphize, I think that's how you say it, sorry if that's not, um, but we anthropomorphize the natural world and we put human values and instincts and morals into it. And so like when we um, look at well, the, the natural food chain and you have, um, predators and prey and like actually we can't anthropomorphize that and at, we need to realize we are top of the food chain and so this I thought was actually a really challenging thing because I think especially when you start getting vegetarian and vegan views and caring for animal rights more you can put human morals into the animal kingdom and I think he's right that it's actually very dangerous and we shouldn't be doing that and so that was a challenge to me however I will say with that point that it is a slippery slope because if we go too far the other way um, and separate ourselves too much from nature and the animal kingdom we can start to um, go down that slope of doing what humanity has done in abusing in taking control in assuming that we have an um, ultimate authority and power over nature which is not the case and shouldn't be the case and finally I've seen a little bit of hope I think specifically um, the chapters around Polyface Farm and that way of doing farming ethically and the way of creating an ecosystem within a farm and raising animals that are fulfilling their purpose and uh, their instincts but are helping each other and I think that gives me hope for the future that you know we can turn um, this dire situation we have in the food industry around that um, that it can be changed and obviously I'm not part of that industry I can only try and rebel um, and not buy stuff and lower demand but 
I'm hopeful that people higher up in that industry will see models like Polyfaith and will start wanting to put that in place. And so that is it, that is the omnivores dilemma. I hope like me that you have been inspired by this video or if you've read the book, been inspired by what you read, I really recommend this book. I think it should be a staple um, read for most people to understand, yeah, where our food comes from. We need to be more in touch with that journey um, from nature to our plate because we can't go on blindly eating what is put in front of us anymore. We need to be active, we need to make informed decisions. Our planet is resting on it and uh, honestly we have a, a responsibility to do something about it. Um, I've been Ash Porter, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.